Hello, everybody. I'm Josh Welsh, president of Film Independent, and I want to welcome you all to this special edition of Film Independent Presents. Um, we are so excited and happy to be able to have a conversation today about Working Man. And this is a, uh, by way of background, I just want to say this is a project that was developed some years ago in our artist development programs in the screenwriting and directing lab here at Film Independent. We are huge fans of Bob Jury, the filmmaker, um, and just so thrilled to see that the film turned out so beautifully. It's such a fantastic independent film. Um, I think it embodies everything that's great about independent film. It's a personal story. It was made, it took a long time to get it made. They, every trick to get it in the can and, and completed. And the result is, is it's just a beautiful film. So if you're watching this, presumably you've seen the film. Um, so you already know that. But uh, before we get started, just quick thanks from me. I wanna thank, um, the lead funder of Film Independent Presents, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. Thank you for your support for making this program possible. We are offering screenings all year long for our members, screenings and conversations, and we could not do it without you. I also wanna thank our, uh, our screening partner, Vision Media, which is the platform on which we do all of our screenings. We love you guys. And last but certainly not least, thanks to our media partner, the Los Angeles Times. Uh, we love you as well. Um, the other thing I want to say, so I am here for one reason and one reason only, which is to introduce our moderator today, the amazing Meg Lefauve. And I just want to say Meg Lefauve had such a profound impact on the development of our artist development programs at Film Independent. Meg, you may not know the extent to which you influence things here, but I, if, if you didn't, I want you to know now. Meg, for several years, led our screenwriting lab and was just elevated our game beyond what we had been doing at that point and showed the, the depth of support that we can offer to filmmakers, the level of, of critical feedback and story development that was possible within the structure of our artist development programs. And um, it's, it's just, it was transformative for us. Uh, and Meg had a, had a, a significant role to play in, in working man finding its way to the world. So we'll hear about that in the conversation. But I just wanna say, Meg, thank you so much for being here, for moderating this talk today. Thank you to everyone from Working Man um, who's here to be part of the conversation. And with that, I will stop blabbering and turn it over to the one and only Meg Lafauve. Thank you, That's, that means a lot to me to hear that um, I had some impact uh, in all those hours. Uh, but it was awesome. I, I, I had such a great time at Find. And I'm so honored to be here and will introduce our wonderful panel. I'm gonna start with the amazing actors, all of whom are receiving praise and mentions for acting awards this year for this film. Uh, Peter Garrity uh, has worked as an actor his entire life. Um, he has, I heard 99 acting credits and directed by the likes of Mike Nichols and Clint Eastwood and many more roles performed on stage and TV, including Home, Homicide, The Wire and Ray Donovan. Um, really excited to have you, Peter. And Billy Brown, uh, who played Walter. And in addition to Working Man, Billy recently completed six seasons on the hit series, How to Get Away with Murder, starring opposite Viola Davis. And he also acted in the ensemble cast of Sons of Anarchy and Dexter. And particularly, I am just so honored um, to be in the presence of Talia Shire, uh, who played Iola, who is a two-time Academy Award nominee and acted in the Rocky and Rocky and Godfather films. And currently she is also supporting her brother Coppola in the release of his new cut of Godfather part three. Um, we also of course have our wonderful director, Robert Jury and Robert, I don't know, is there anything particular you would like me to say about? Is this, this is the first time film, yes? It is and uh, you played a large part in this as, as Josh mentioned from the introduction from our, our days in the lab, you are, you were the guiding force in those days and, and really helped um, you know you and, and film independent. This was, this was the launching pad uh, many years ago, but um, here we are now and it's been a long road, but so happy that, uh, that you're with us today and that the, the, the film is, is, is out and being enjoyed by audiences. Yeah, it's so exciting. And I introduced you back in the day to Clark Peterson, who is the producer of the film 
who's done many, many films, including the, the award-winning Monster. Um, and two other producers we're lucky to have with us today, Lovell Holder and Maya um, uh, um, Medell. Um, and did I pronounce your, right, your last name wrong, Maya? Let's get it right. Maya email. Email, there, see, I knew I was gonna get one wrong. I'm sorry, Maya, it's you, I'm sorry. Um, I'm terrible with names, people. But here I am, I'm a really good question answer, questioner. So uh, let's go. Robert, um, can, let's just start with the inspiration for this film. Um, it's really such a specific place and time and characters, you know, was it inspired by real events or something in your personal life? A uh, little bit of both. You know, I grew up around factory towns in the Midwest, so uh, Mississippi River factory towns. So I, I know a lot about these people and places. Um, but also as the, the project evolved, um, there's, a, there's a theme of, of mental health, mental illness um, that developed over a course of months and years that is also pretty personal to me and, and my family. So the, those things came together and, and kind of married um, but it, as, I, as I say, it, it, it developed over time with the screenplay and very different than the one that I brought to the, the screenwriting lab that you read for the first time. You know, how, how did that develop in terms of, I love where the film goes. It doesn't go where you're going to expect it to go. Um, and we're not going to, I don't know if everybody's seen it on watching, so I don't want to give anything away, but I, I really found the direction it took deeply, deeply moving. Um, you know, was that, so that wasn't something you planned from the beginning. That's something that evolved. Was that in working with Clark and the producers? It was, uh, and the actors, you know, even on set. Um, but it, I think it, you know, if I can, I, I want to go back to something you told me and, and maybe the first experience in the Film Independent Screenwriting Lab. We, all the screenwriters um, got their opportunity around the table to kind of discuss and workshop the project and I remember for my specific screenplay and I knew it, it was probably a flawed piece of material and was lucky to get into the lab when it did and um, as we went around the room and the other writers were talking about the story um, you know they were saying pretty much complimentary things and then it got to Meg and and she said um, you said this is this is really this is really nice but what are you really trying to say here and I just, that as maybe as hard as that was for me to hear at the time, it was such, so important as I, as I moved forward and developed that, that story. And um, uh, yeah, I, I just think as, as the years rolled by, um, Clark and I worked a lot developing the story, you know, and as I say, when we got on to set, uh, Billy, Talia, Peter, they came to me with ideas that I think only enhanced the story. Um, Maya, Lovell, they, I, I, I'm, this, this team is here because it really was a collective effort. I, if, if you enjoy the film, it's because of uh, these people here and, and others who really contributed. That's amazing. Well, thank you to all of you because we are all the beneficiaries. It is a truly beautiful, moving film. Um, Clark. Meg, can I, oh. Meg, can I ask you a question? I'm not yes, just ready. So when you, in this development of this unique piece, was that the same 40 pages <laughs> of the main character played by Peter just walking? Cause that was so fascinating to me cause I love to read things on, on the page. And I was taken aback by the writer's audacity of having a character not say a thing. But was that there as well? And did you nurture? that uh, uh, courage on the writer's part. <laughs> I remember that to be in the original. It's one of the things I really stood out to me. I, I believe Clark, when I gave it to you, it's one of the things we talked about mm -hmm. was the kind of intense quietness of the piece and that I really thought there was something special behind that quiet. Um, but Clark, you really developed the piece. So would you want to speak to that? Um, sure. Um, I mean, look, again, a lot of us developed it with Bob and it really is Bob's vision, but uh, you know, the thing, whenever someone asks me how this started for me, it really was you because you, it, in a very succinct log line, you said that it's a factory town and the factory closes down and uh, there's one worker who really doesn't know what to do and he decides to keep going to his job every day. And, you know, that was even really 
before mm. there were, you know, some of the, the other themes of mental illness and all that. I mean, there was there was definitely the sun in the in the background, but um, but you know that was the thing that really struck me. It was this idea of a person doing something just kind of so nonsensical or illogical, you know, almost like Don Quixote or something like that. He was just doing this thing. And um, that was the thing that from the moment you said that, that grabbed me. And then when I said, sure, you know, why don't you give me the screenplay? I I do remember you saying like, it's quiet, it's a quiet piece, but I think it, you know, there's really something special there. And look, I mean, it was, again, it it was an interesting evolution with Bob too, because you know, what, what becomes the sort of even biggest theme of the movie with regard to mental illness and, you know, some of those really powerful elements, you know, that is something that Bob kind of happened upon once we were in development. And he was, you know, we were both sort of looking, like we knew the script was sort of 80% there, but there was something missing that we couldn't, you know, quite figure out what it needed. And we tried you know, a few different things. And, you know, someone suggested magical realism at one point. And I remember having that conversation with Bob and he was like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's right. And so, but I think again, it was in, you know, that I could sort of turn it back to Bob where, how he was able to, to find these other themes to kind of interweave with, with what was already there and to make it this, you know, even more powerful piece. So Peter and Talia, um, the quietness of that marriage as well, especially in the beginnings of this of the movie, um, that kind of lack of intimacy in the marriage. I just love the quietness and all, and I really found the film so beautiful in how it is so little dialogue, but it's allowing the actors to be center and to center the story with your performance, with your faces and and your behavior. And I just wondered with the two of you in terms of creating this marriage, did you do any kind of special preparation or how was that creating that beautiful blocked intimacy together? I've been married a couple of times. <laughs> oh, <my God>. uh, <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm a jerk. Um, it's relevant. I, I don't... So you were drawing from your own experience. Actually, I, I was drawing from my own experience, but I'm also a father and a grandfather and um, I just, uh, it just, I think that if I had, you know, by the time I got the script, I, I'm not in a position, I wasn't in a position Clark was in where, where uh, things developed that primar- primal things developed later on. I, I received a script that I knew that I had a son that died, that we had a son that, that took his life. And um, I'll tell you, as a father, I mean, I've thought of that a lot. I've thought, I have, I have kids that grew up in the 70s and the 80s, uh, well, no, 90s, um, and, and did a lot of drugs and everything. And there were times when I just realized that I would not be able to handle it uh, if I had a kid that committed suicide. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be able to handle it if, a kid, if I had a kid that died. So in order to kind of like uh, deal with a vulnerability that at least that the two of them, that Talia, that Iola and, and Allery go through uh, the grief that they still have and will, uh, will always have. The, the sense of guilt that I know that I had, that I felt, and nothing happened to my kids, but the sense of guilt that I would have had, uh, you know. So um, that sort of vulnerability, you know, when I think of those, those uh, days of, walking on the other side of the sidewalk, walking back and forth um, to go into the factory. Um, I, d- I don't know if I don't, I don't know if Allery doesn't know what to do with himself. What I do know is what I don't want to do with myself. I can't yes, sit home. Yes, and that is so beautifully, beautifully felt. You can feel it as a viewer that is so beautifully communicated in all, your entire body language. And Talia, for you, is playing the, the wife of this man that you can't reach. Um, did you do any preparation or how, how was that for you? Well, actually, in this particular piece, I did a backstory. I wanted to go into 
her life. This was a child that came late in their marriage. He was a musician. So that sense of a lost melody that was always in the house. But I, I, I know this from the little bit of research that I've done is that if you lose a child, many marriages fall apart after that because you can't comfort the other person. You can't, you just, you go around it in a sense that walk was going around it. Uh, I also think uh, my character has a ritual as well. She goes to the market, she goes to the graveyard, but also I did that work of the spine. You know, the, what is the spine of the pe There is a town that's dying. There's a, there's a factory that's dying. It's, it's it, before it's time. And that worked perfectly. I just wanted to set it though and give it a sort of shape so it, it had a good balance. And there, and then there was, there was the Walter, there was Billy who I felt and I've said this before, was the angel. So it, be, it, it has that romantic, magical feeling of, of a moment in time, even though our Walter has the same illness, you know, as our son, Peter, you know, Allery's son, there is something magical and, and quite extraordinary about the piece and Robert, jury that he dared to put all these things together still to me is an amazement. Absolutely. Uh, and, I love, and I love Kelly, your performance when you first meet Walter and you're like, let me explain what's going to happen here. You are going to do this. It's so great. So uh -huh. I, uh, Billy, Billy, um, wonderful to meet you. Um, so in taking on this role, um, you know, it starts out seemingly almost like a supporting character. And then he he evolves in, in, in the story. Was there anything that you particularly loved about the character when you read it or anything that particularly scared you about taking on this role as an actor? You know, right away when I read it, I knew I would do it, but I had to reconcile myself how I was gonna get to the starting line, if you will, because Bob had so many layers and so many rhythms in the entire working man script with all of the interplay of the characters, with the, with the town, the tapestry of the last factory set against the, um, the unemployment, the reality of you know, homes being lost and livelihoods going away and, um, and the loss of a child with the parks. And you know, Walt Brewer's own, his inability to confront his own demons, his own frailties and you know, walking on in his wife. Is that the first time it's happened? The 15th time, you know, Walter knew when we learned without giving too much away that there were characteristics and traits that he couldn't, he couldn't come to grips with, but he knew he didn't want to pass those on to his child or mm. children. And that's a lot, you know, for a man, as I imagine, who wanted nothing more than to have children of his own and realizing he was the one who had to say no to that and the woman he loved yeah. There's, there's a lot of layers going on here. And, yeah. uh, and I knew when I read it, I said, uh, the first scene on the porch, as I said many times, I told Bob this too. We meet Walter Brewer. We meet me there with the models and the painting and the, and the detailed work and the cigarette dangling and the neighbors and the scuttlebutt. And there's our Allery mm -hmm. Parks making his foray into his own new future, which he didn't know what be held for him. Neither did Walter and how the two would become intertwined in the most beautiful of ways. So taking all that in in the first five, 10, 15 read-throughs and talking to Bob, I said to myself, I gotta, I gotta find a way to get to that starting line. Once there, everything's gonna, That's everything's awesome. gonna work out beautifully. Amazing. So all of you were just worked on this film, which was a true indie film let's call her a low budget, under a million, I understand. Um, well, actually, before we move to that, I want to ask Lovell and Maya one more creative question. And then I'd like to do a round with you all in terms of working on an indie film like this and what's that like for each of your various roles. But Lovell and Maya, for you as producers, was there anything that you envisioned on the page when you said, yes, I want to come on and produce this that changed significantly 
in the in on the day in the edit room that that you know really evolved for you or as producers you found exciting um you did me go ahead yeah <laughs> okay no um well for me the first thing that kind of naturally jumped to mind was the image of the factory um and when we discovered that location um because it as these guys have heard me talk about ad nauseum on set and since, um, my dad had a, a trucking company when I was growing up. So I was in a lot of industrial spaces as a kid. And so being back in that environment and feeling, smelling those smells of my childhood and all that stuff was something that kind of caught me off guard that like I hadn't really expected when reading the script because it's a very intellectual experience. And you're thinking like, oh, the mechanics of this and everything, but to something like, walk into one of those spaces that you kind of know on that biological cellular level. Um, what, what was very, very fulfilling for me. And I don't, I don't, I can't imagine another project that I'll ever work on that will have that impact and so viscerally associate so much with like my dad specifically. Cause when I read the script, um, it very much felt like this, this was a movie that I wanted to get on board with uh, because I thought he would like. Um, cause I think it's always important for each of us as creatives to sort of know, well, okay, I'm doing this project for X amount of reasons, but who in my life is it really for that? I can really take it to them and say, Hey, I'm, I'm proud of this. I, I want you to enjoy it. That's great. Yeah. That, do you think that the first movie I made, my father watched and he said, who would make that? <laughs> my parents, my parents <laughs> review. It had yeah. a very sad ending. It had a really sad ending and he did not like sad endings, but I will. No, that's the, the, the first movie I produced, my mother was like, why was there so much cursing? They just, they never stopped cursing. <laughs> All right, Maya, was there anything for you from script to, to making the film? Absolutely. So I think just reading it, I just thought, oh my gosh. I want to just show all these layers of the man, this word that working man mentality, that macho-ness, this I gotta do this and I'm the provider. And I feel like what we really jumped off the page is all the layers. Once you remove that work, and I feel like even right now, just 2020, <laughs> you know, people don't some um unemployment is at an all-time high and people are having to face those issues. And Iola's character, she, there, you don't have a huge scene with her where, um, you know, she's taking five minutes to scream and she's, and she's speaking literally just in her in her movements, in her silence, in her manuals, the way she moves around these two men and she gets them to get their act together. Uh, and it's called working man, you know, um, it's just kind of like, you know, you you go Taya. Um, but just, just really and truly just the showing those different layers of the man. And let me tell you the feminine energy, we didn't have that much. It was mostly guys we we're working with, but I, I truly feel like we were able to just unpeel those layers. And that to me is the heart of the film is just unpeeling the layers of the working man. Yes, lovely, I totally agree. Um, so let's do a round of one more que of another questions, and then we'll go to the audience questions because I really want to talk about making an indie film at this budget level. So Robert, for you first as the director, what were there creative things you had to compromise on that you you just couldn't get, or for this budget level, any insider you know behind the scenes? What what are the scenes we didn't see? Um, you know, to be honest, I I think um, I kind of wrote this with an independent budget in mind. I knew when I was working on it that it was just from an idea standpoint, I didn't really think this was a studio movie. So, uh, you know, you always wish you had two things, more time and more money, right? But um, you, it was really kind of engineered. And I think it's a story that 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 works for, for an independent film. And, um, and again, I, I, I I just can't um, express enough just how much the the team around you is 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 going to determine the outcome, right? Ultimately, so you're you're really dependent upon your producing partners, those actors who come in. You don't have a ton of time. I mean, most people who've made an independent film know this. You don't have a ton of time of any time for rehearsal. People have to come in ready to go, and you're just hit the ground running right and that's that's the nature of the beast and so it's um you kind of cross your fingers a little bit going into it but um as far as budgetary um challenges yeah always but um i, I think it's a story that that was that that was sort of engineered as i say for for this type of budget yeah yeah 
Um, and lucky you had these three amazing thoroughbred actors who could work Absolutely. in. Um, Absolutely. So Clark, um, for you, now uh, listen, you're a, you're a known producer. You can choose a lot of different things. Uh, you chose a movie that's gonna be, you know, uh, a, an in, a small indie film. Um, do you have any advice for the people listening who I'm sure there's a lot of filmmakers out there um, in terms of doing this kind of movie at this kind of budget level? Um, well, you know, uh, I think I got involved in this because I cared about what it was about, you know, and I think that as filmmakers, I mean, hopefully, you know, most people, especially in this organization are, you know, getting involved, not for the great financial reward, but for the artistic expression and for doing things that they care about. So, I mean, um, and I think it's really a, a blessing when you when you choose a project like this, um, that kind of probably naturally comes along with a small budget. Um, I sort of look at it as a blessing because everyone who gets involved is getting involved for the right reasons. Um, nobody got involved in this project uh, for the money. <laughs> um, and it's it sort of gives you this, you know, automatic screening service of like cutting out people who might possibly get in for the wrong reason. So, um, you know, I really do think that a lot of movies when, you know, when you make a movie with a huge budget, like the schedule gets bloated and everything is just going to get fixed in post in VFX. And, you know, there's so many things that actually can harm the movie. And in this case, you know, we knew we had a small budget. We knew what we needed to do. We need, we knew the kinds of actors we needed great actors, but great actors who would really want to, to take on these characters and were doing it for that reason. And, everybody here on this team was doing it for the right reasons. Um, so I would say, you know, as a, if you're an independent filmmaker, like, yes, look at that as, as a blessing in a weird way, um, because, you know, you're forced to think outside the box. You're forced to come up with creative solutions and you're forced to work with a group of people that care about what they're doing. And so, um, you know, it, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there would have been a couple of things that would have been great to have at some point along the way, but I don't think the movie really wants for anything. Um, I mean, you I know, know. so like we, uh, you know, we, you know, we took it on and, and did, we did what we had with what, with what we, what we could with what we had. I remember from the very beginning, Talia always kind of referring to this as like a troop of artists. Um, <laughs> And that, you know, even as we were assembling everyone, it was like trying to put together a troop and maybe, you know, how you, how you can speak to that, but it is about like finding a group of collaborators who care. And yes, we felt like a, a, a troop of performers or, you know, of artists who got together to make something. Thank you, uh, to Clark's point, uh, if I could say this with, when you have the trappings of a large budget and the financials behind it, you often get removed from the intangibles, especially with a story like this. Pop story has so many intangibles that you cannot, you can't fabricate and see. They have to be experienced, they have to be felt. And the sets we felt, the real homes, the neighborhood, the truck I drove, maybe it didn't start at times. You know, we didn't have Teamsters for the asking to fix this and run around and get that. We were the ones doing it. Craft service was a little fold-out table. So at every waking moment while you were on set and away from set, you were very close in your imagination to what it may be like in some aspect of the lives of those we were bringing to, uh, you know, to the camera every day. You know, we were in it. It was cold. We we're in a garage huddled around one heater <laughs> when it's 20 degrees outside, waiting to go back to set, which was a small little house. And who was little driving? Little Maya was driving. Lola right, Maya was driving. driving. Clark drove us every every morning. Yeah, the, all the cast drivers are, are here on the call. Too many secrets. Yes, you have the producers <laughs> and the entire driving team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Lovell was driving us. How does so it affect all, all the that informs the decisions you're making? So that affects the acting experience. Yeah, right, right. But there's one. If I have one one little second, I happen to love the independent film experience also because I love the crew. I love these passionate young people who come and they're 
you know, we're all doing this thing together. And so I have a real sense of, of being the older member of the group. And so I like to teach and I smuggle things in like, you know, I remember when Barbara Stanwyck told me you have to act for that, Barbara Stanwyck. Yeah, no, you know, B Barbara Stan. And I suddenly realized a lot of them didn't know who Barbara Stanwyck was, but it's my job, I think, as a teacher, because an actor is a teacher, to say, yeah, Barbara Stanwyck said, you just act for that space, oh. And so I felt, so that's part of the joy for me, working on independent films, is to do the performance and to teach this new young generation of exciting filmmakers as well, that are all there, you know, doing the hair, the makeup, taking their clothes off to give it to you so you could put it on. It was just that kind of, it's, it's thrilling to tell you the truth, thrilling. And Peter, my, my understanding is that um, this was your first lead for an indie film. Did that have any impact on, on you as an actor? Uh, no, not really. I don't think so. I mean, I've, I've been doing this since 1953. <laughs> and, uh, and that's a kind of a long time. And, and uh, I, I worked for about uh, 25 years in a theater company before I ever, I, I had done one uh, film. Uh, uh, with, what's her name? Geraldine Chaplin, as a matter of fact, but I played just this tiny little role. I've done little tiny roles all my life, but I spent 25 years doing nothing but Shakespeare and Gorky and Chekhov and all of that with a great theater company that had as its director, Adrian Hall, this crazy Texan, whose god, uh, theatrically wise, was Grotowski, the Polish uh, director, Grotowski, who famously wrote a, wrote a book called Toward a Poorer Theater. And that's really what we're talking about is Toward a Poorer Theater. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I fell in love with from the time I was a little kid watching my sister act was the community. I fell in love with the community. So that's really why I'm in the ball game. I'm in the ball game for the community. And I have lovely, lovely friends all over the place. I don't know, I don't know what friends Allery has, you know, or what friends, you see the three amigos on the porch cooking up something, you see them talking to Walter even, you see Walter inviting us to dinner, you see, um, you know, various and sundry people throughout the course of the thing. Allery doesn't really, Allery has yeah. lost that thread of having friends as a human being. Yeah. And I think and I think that's one of the things that changes and, and how Walter's it changes. Your friend. Yeah, Walter's your first friend. Yeah. Yeah, I think that Walter has become my friend. By the end of time, Walter has become my friend. Yeah. yeah. So and it's a, it's just an amazing process where uh, uh, how do how do you how do you be a human being uh, and be alive all these years as an older human being and be still searching around or, but not very obviously for how you go about living a life. How do you, how do you, how do you, you know, I mean, I don't think Allery knows how, and it takes Walter's intercession and, and, his, and Iola's intercession to say, you're going to live a life. There's yeah. going to be a life that's still, yep. you know, out there to yeah. be lived. And that was beautifully done. I mean, it's really is. I, I have to say my favorite scene of so many, but the end last scene to me, I just, I just loved it. So we have some really good questions from our audience. So I'm going to jump over to those. Um, so Matt asks for Robert and Billy. How did you make sure that Walter's mental illness was portrayed realistically and responsibly? Well, um, maybe I can field this first, Billy, and you can fill in the gaps from, from an actor's perspective. But um, uh, I, I lost a, a very close cousin uh, of mine um, to suicide. And back in, in the days when he was first being diagnosed with, with mental illness or health issues it was uh 
manic depression is what they call it. most people would refer to it as bipolar now or maybe diagnose that so a lot if you're talking about and and this is something that i didn't enter into lightly because i knew it was, it was well it was very personal to me to my family um, i talked with uh, family members that were affected my surviving cousin my, my aunt um, even know you know to ask if this was even appropriate that I should do something like this and, and introduce in the story. I just felt like it was um, something that our family had discussed and been so much a part of our lives that, that maybe this is a story worth telling um, and for others to hear. And so much of what um, Billy's character represents, and also some of the even the conversations he had, particularly his relationship with his. Uh, again, not to give too much away the story, but his past relationships, uh, those are those are based on conversations, real conversations that happened. And um, as I've, I've told uh, others before, maybe the greatest compliment I've ever received in doing, you know, or when we were on the, when we were at film festivals and so forth, when people would come up afterwards and say, you know, I, I have bipolar disorder, or I have uh, some mental health issues, or I have someone in my family who does. Um, and they thought that this was um, a true, but also respectful portrayal. And um, one that didn't, again, you know, criminalize mental health or mental illness, but, uh, and, and, you know, hopefully provide maybe a little hopeful message as well. Um, it's, you know, Billy can talk a little bit more about what, what went into his performance, but I, I, just in meeting Billy and the type of person he was, I, I knew from the very beginning that this, is, that he would give, um, just a very truthful, um, portrayal and that, that, that's meant a lot. Just again, having received the, the reactions later when, when people see and experience the, the film. Billy, how was it for you? All right, thanks for the question. Thanks, Bob. I, uh, I always refer back to the words on the page and what Bob brought to all of us in Working Men, the screenplay and, and Walter Brewer as I approached, you know, all of that, um, you know, the signposts, if you will, the, his movements, his choices, whether I knew why, Walter was doing them at that moment, or even if Walter knew mm. exactly that choice and what might befall him and those around him, you know, what might come from this decision and the following decision. Does he try to take that back, strike it from the record if it doesn't work, or does he continue to move forward? Those subtleties made my choices all the more clear. And that comes from, again, what was on the page. And then, as Bob just said, where his inspiration and the truth of it came from. And uh, there was a friend of mine I was in college with who we discovered years later was suffering from, uh, I, I believe, type 1 bipolar disorder, uh, maybe some type 2. We were, very, we were very tight. And so I was there at one or two penultimate moments in his life that, had I not been, um, thank God he would have completely gone to a place where no one could have brought him back. And witnessing how it began to manifest without clearly understanding it. And I imagine some of the audience will see uh, what I'm doing and working in and maybe it's, they know something's not familiar to what they would consider a healthy mind and spirit and body. Something is, and that's really all it takes. You know, in the creative process. Yeah. Um, and then it doesn't become a spectacle or it doesn't become uh, something that is what it shouldn't be. Yeah. The truth is there. And we know Walter does need help. And we start to learn more and more uh, about who he is and where he's come from and, and hopefully where he will end up. And that's what I saw in a friend of mine. And those are some of the, you know, some of the honest moments that I was able to to sort of call upon and bring yeah. to this preparation. Just a beautiful, authentic, honest performance. Um, 
bravery of both you and Robert to bring all that personal um, to the to the to the piece is deeply felt. Um, Lovell and Maya and probably Clark and Robert too, but uh, we have two questions about locations. Um, both Trip and John are asking about um, how you chose the locations and just how all the beautiful shots of the locations um, around the neighborhood and the bridges. And I, 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 they're asking if that was intentional. I would assume Robert it was. And then Maya and uh, Lovell, can you talk about working in those locations and choosing them? Of course. We had an awesome locations team. Um, one, two, we did some movie magic for you guys. And Bob had written very specific, he had a very specific look in mind. So we were like, okay, well, this this house is perfect for Walter, but this house is more perfect for um, Allery and Iola. So we did some movie magic and we were able to make you guys this amazing neighborhood. Um, yeah. Level, do you want to talk more? Um, the the bridge shots were amazing. They were. You want to talk about that day? Oh yes, no. Uh, so we shot in total for 19 days in uh, the suburb of Norwich, which is right outside of Chicago, and it's right by O'Hare. There was a time in my life when I could have told you the entire flight wow. route, every plane that was leaving Greater Chicago. Um, poor poor Sal Martinez, who um. Uh, played Benny, his big, wonderful, climactic speech. Oh my gosh. Every single international flight was coming in every 10 minutes during that four man speech. He was the best sport about it. And I was there with the sound guy. I was like, we've got this line. Yeah, we've got this one in this take. We got that. We got it. It's in 17, the patchwork quilt, but we have it. Um, but so we were in Norwich for uh, the first 19 days of the shoot. And then for the last day, day 20, we went down to Joliet, Illinois, which is about an hour and a half, two hours south of Chicago. And that's where uh, all the bridge shots and some of the various shots of Peter walking around the abandoned town were taken. Um, and it was a really, I mean, literally, it was, it was an electric night, uh, the shots of Allery on the bridge, because uh, summer was just starting to come in after we'd had the coldest April that Chicago had had since the 1800s. And we had lightning that was happening, all heat lightning happening. And Piero Basso, our, our brilliant DP was like, ah, oh, my glory, my glory. <laughs> um, and so the locations, especially that factory, as we, we, we like to say, it's kind of the fourth lead of the film because the movie really does live and die by the authenticity of that factory. Um, and it was such an, an education to, to be in that environment and be with those people who were so, overwhelmingly generous to us with both their space and their hospitality. And I think also reflected in practice a mission that Bob was very attentive to, and I'll let him speak about this more in casting, which is that the, the, the manufacturing workforce is one of the most diverse workforces in America. It's, it's a very even breakdown of men and women and a very even breakdown of different ethnicities and demographics. And it was something that I certainly, as, as this, white gay guy living in LA, like I wasn't thinking like, oh yeah, the diversity of the American factory system. And then like we watched some documentaries and then being on the ground, it's like, it's really staggering how many groups are comprised in this and are all wrestling with the exact same economic uncertainty. And I think how Bob reflected that in the casting with our, our brilliant local Chicago actors um, is, is just tremendous. Um, but I'll, I'll let Bob speak more about McRae because Bob has, very much maintained his relationship with Brian Miller, who was the manager there. Uh, sure, I mean, McRae Manufacturing, Meg, was, was the, the location, the factory location, and, and uh, Brian, as, they, as Lovell mentioned, was the, the, the manager there, and he was really a, a, a consultant for Peter and Billy and helping us around the factory and showing us how to work the machinery and so forth. Um, Sadly enough, the, the factory that we shot in closed down one year after we shot there. I mean, just kind of remarkable, just, just as the story uh, played out. Um, but um, yeah, it was, it, it was it, as Level mentions, it's, it's just a, it's another character, right? I mean, when we, we walked into that facility, we knew that that was, that was really a, a, the place for us. It was an older factory. It felt um, 
you could feel the history in a place like that. 70 years, 70 years it had been in operation before it closed last December. We had another question, Robert, just to, to piggyback on that about how long this whole process took you from mm. being in the fine lab to being here today. Do you want to? Uh, yeah, sol solid decade. Uh, Meg and I met in 2010 in the screenwriting lab. And so I guess if I can preach anything to the aspiring filmmakers who may be out there, it's it's patience is a virtue, right? I mean, we, um, and, and um, you know, keep keep after it, keep keep writing your story until it's it's where you think it it it, it should be for uh, as you you told me way back in the lab, right? What is it that you really want to say? Well, uh, and look how today every person on this call has talked about what you wanted to say and how they're bringing their own personal insights into that. So they're all moving around. It's why Clark wanted to do it in, as a producer and you know Billy's talking about the, the the pieces of the script and that 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 beautiful magic juice that you brought which is brave it's brave to that you went towards the direction of the mental illness I think was uh, brave and there's a bravery to artistry so and all of you were brave but Robert you had to go into the breach first so I hope that all of our listeners uh, hear that uh, thread moving through all of these responses, um, all the way to level saying, you know, it reminded him of his dad. Like all of that is coming up because Robert, you went in first. Um, so maybe a last question here, um, because I know everybody's curious and we had a couple of questions about it um, for everyone, uh, but I probably Robert and Clark, you will have the most possibly to say about releasing a film during COVID. How's that? <laughs> How about it? In interesting. Um, well, I can uh, I can start. You know, we were we were thrilled that we um, we landed. You know, we we did festivals with our film, and then we landed a little theatrical release, and we were so excited for this because, as everyone probably knows, at this budget level, it's very rare that you even get a theatrical release. So we were very excited, and our our theatrical release was scheduled for the end of March, <clears throat> and so. Of course, uh, as we got closer to our theatrical release, we realized it was doomed. And we, <laughs> we, we in initially thought we are doomed and our movie is doomed. Um, and you know, unfortunately our theatrical release that was gonna be in a few cities was canceled. Um, but the very strange uh, powers of 2020 took over and all of a sudden, our movie went from being a, a small movie that was going to be released in a few theaters to a national digital VOD video on demand release. And when that happened, um, you know, our, the publicist was able to go out and tell all of the, the reviewers out there that this, our, our theatrical release was canceled. So now it's a, a national uh, VOD release. And all of a sudden, um, all of these reviewers who probably would not have been able to look at our film because our, our film was not opening in their city, all of a sudden they all did. And we were being written up in the New York Times and in the Washington Post and in the LA Times and you know all of these great places. And we now have over 40 reviews and we're certified fresh and all of that. Um, but I'm, I mentioned, <laughs> thank you. I mentioned that just because it, it was the strangest ride ever. Uh, and the reason that all of this happened um, was because of what the film's about, you know? Um, I'm kind of burying the lead here, but it's about people in work and, and being out of work. And suddenly our film was resonating with people and more so than ever could have happened in a, in a normal year. So, I mean, uh, Bob, you can fill in the blanks because Bob also has an amazing ending to this whole release and how, what we did with it. but. Um, I mean, this is a very strange and unique year. And, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, I think our film was able to be seen by more people and, you know, was resonated with more people just because of the strange things that have happened this year. Yeah, and I would, I would just say, you know, as, as Clark mentioned, the kind of the, um, the last bit of a, the, or, or an alternative, right, to not being in theaters is uh, what do you do during COVID and coronavirus and when everyone is at, at the socially distance and the theaters are closed down. Um, I want to say that Billy was the first person who said, what about drive-ins? Can we do this? 
and um, we went to our distributor. And when you have a, a smaller independent distributor, they, they oftentimes, or at least in our case, said, go for it, gang. And so we took the movie on the road and uh, we went actually and screened throughout the Rust Belt. Um, I, 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 are you from Warren, Ohio, Meg? Did I read that? Is that, is I that am true? I am Warren, we, Ohio. Yeah, that's, uh, we actually screened at a uh, drive-in theater in your hometown, out in the Rust Belt. Um, and so it, in, in doubling back, the last place we screened the movie uh, as part of our tour was at McRae Manufacturing. We projected the movie on the outside of that, that factory where, where we shot the movie. And um, as of now, it's, it's, it's scheduled for demolition, unfortunately, uh, in, in if in the coming days. So it's, I, I don't know, it's, it's such a, all, of, all I can say right now is we, I think I can speak for the whole group is we, we have a lot of gratitude because I know that a lot of the country is suffering um, with regards to, again, job loss, um, loss of life, just um, the, the, the opportunities that we're getting right now just to share this story when we have it and that, that uh, these, these people around me here, I'm, I'm so glad that they're healthy um, and, uh, we're just, <laughs> we're just happy to be here, right? <laughs> just, just happy to be around and, and sharing this. Well, we're also lucky that you, Robert, took the long haul, you and Clark on this 10 year journey and that you found these incredible artists to work with you. And I include Maya and Lovell in that as well. Producers are amazing artists. And that, because we all have reaped the benefit of your work. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful film. So thank you all so much for coming to do this Q&A today.